What, what's my privilege to do is to uh, introduce to you the, the first uh, Jaron James lecturer, and that is uh, Emeritus Professor Ron Dubois. And uh, because he is speaking on per personalized medicine, uh, it, I, I had a few personalized uh, comments and pictures to include, and hopefully they'll be able to come up. It should say Wasag Newman James. There it is. Thank you. Uh, so with that, uh, I'd like to give a little bit of an introduction to Ron. And, you know, Ron is a modest guy. You have to understand that. And so uh, he's probably, over the last few days, been most uncomfortable with the fact that I was even introducing him. But I'm really grateful to be able to do that, because I want you to uh, see Ron a little bit the way that I see him. Um, here we go. First of all... This is, this is a photograph taken at the 8th Wausau Conference, which we held in, in Colorado, when we went to the Dude Ranch for a day. And, and uh, considering that Ron usually uses the expression dude when he talks to me, uh, I thought I'd include this. Uh, for some of you, if you don't know, he is a native son of the Netherlands, uh, born in Eindhoven. Was that close? Okay. Uh, uh, trained at Cambridge. A visiting scientist, uh, worked with Ron Crystal at NHLBI, consultant physician and head of the ILD unit, and uh, clinical genomics group at Royal Brompton, uh, on to being professor of respiratory medicine at Royal Brompton and at Imperial College. Uh, in, uh, over the last several years, we had the uh, privilege and pleasure of having uh, Ron with us in Denver for uh, part of each year for a number of years, where he contributed to the development of translational research uh, goals at that center, and is now emeritus professor at Imperial College. Uh, what it doesn't tell you is, uh, is so much about Ron as an individual, and this is really a very deserved honor. Let's, let's talk about the academic stuff first. This, though, I, I do want to point out is taken in Colorado, and it's Ron uh, with his wife, Sue, uh, on the top of, uh, is that Vail? Yeah. Uh, this has been an illustrious and uh, certainly um, uh, uh, superb uh, career in both research and in clinical medicine, with more than 250 peer-reviewed publications and continuing to publish uh, many review articles, chapters, books, and monographs, really an extraordinary contribution to the field uh, of sarcoidosis, scleroderma, uh, systemic sclerosis, uh, chronic beryllium disease, diffuse lung diseases, uh, I could go on. Uh, much of it focused around uh, something that is at the heart of what I think Ron Dubois has brought to this field, which is a compassion for uh, the, the patients, the people who have these diseases that we're trying to, uh, to treat and better diagnose. He's a dedicated scholar, but I, I think it's also worth mentioning, many of you know that Ron has been and is a mentor uh, to many of us and, uh, and a colleague to many of us as well. Uh, he's also uh, a, not only a devoted husband, but also a father. Here's a picture with uh, his son, Jonathan, and his daughter, Ellie, uh, and, and also a, a dear friend. Uh, sometimes bearable, <laughs> other times maybe not. Uh, but with that, uh, I would like to turn the podium over to Ron and, and uh, welcome him to give this lecture. Thank you. Lee, that was f far too kind, but, but, but very much appreciated. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to start by thanking Moi Elaine. Do you remember when this was? This was the last time I was in the street. It's absolutely delight to be back here. But this was when Maya Elaine gave her professorial oration. I, I had a picture of Ulrich and me wearing Rembrandt hats, but I thought we probably not better not distract. And I'm delighted to be here at this meeting. Already, it, it's it's a highlight, and it's a highlight for all sorts of reasons. But what, what struck me is what you've done is you've creatively provided an eclectic mix. Of, of issues to deal with, and some of them very innovative, and I just love the way this is blended, and I think it's just been absolutely uh, outstanding to date. So I want to thank you for, for me being here, uh, and I want to thank you for your meeting. 
But I really also need to say what an absolute privilege it is to have been invited to, to give the first honored uh, Jerry James lecture. Um, Jerry was a remarkable man, and I can't better what Elise Lauer has just said. But, but I would just like to add a couple of things to that. Um, he had great talents and, and great drives and great interests, and possibly the two of them were being from Wales, never England, and never even Great Britain. Jerry was from Wales. Uh, and of course, his love for sarcoidosis. And I suspect his, his loves were in reverse order. And sarcoid is what drove him. He was innovative. He was enthusiastic. He was desperately keen to make sure the interest endured over time. And I think he's already succeeded in that. We, we're now in the third generation post-James. And I think, therefore, he succeeded in that goal. Um, just two quick anecdotes. The first time I met Jerry James, I mean it's the same anecdote, was 1974 when I applied for a job to work for him as a junior fellow. And uh, the first question he asked me was, do you play rugby? Which is what they play in Wales, and I didn't. And then the second thing is he, he didn't give me the job, and it sh shows that Jerry has great insight, doesn't it? But despite that, he was kind enough to recommend me to a friend, and I then was able to develop some kind of a career. So Jerry means a lot to me. So what I thought I'd do, I thought this topic was extraordinarily difficult for all sorts of reasons. So what I've decided to do is to uh, break it down into a number of, of bite-sized portions. So I would like to say what, how I perceive what, what, Im, what personalized medicine is and what it means. I'd like to address the issue of kind of be practical. We can sit in an ivory tower and decide how we should personalize. But, but can we make it practical so that we can use it? And I'll address that by giving some examples outside sarcoidosis and then looking within sarcoidosis. Sarcoid has very singular challenges which have been dealt with extraordinarily well throughout the last uh, couple of days. But can we personalize it? Can we customize the way in which we see an individual patient? Uh, and I'll conclude by some w thoughts about whether we're there yet, whether we're nearly there yet, and what we may need to aim for. And so I enjoyed looking at this uh, review article in uh, the New England Journal of Medicine from last year, which basically was a vehicle for showing how uh, the FDA and NIH were going to approach the problem of individualizing healthcare and setting up a number of, in, of uh, issues, of platforms, of, of initiatives that were going to allow and fund research to try to get at that. And that would include uh, a, a, a program of um, bringing phase two drugs on and facilitating the testing of phase two drugs. And I think that's something that all of us who are interested in rare lung disease would welcome. I'd like to broaden that a little bit because I think it's not just about the drugs, delivering the right drug at the right time to the right patient, but I, I think we need to broaden it into all aspects of, of health care. And I think we need to customize how we deal with the patient in toto, not necessarily just deciding on what pharmaceutical therapy is necessary. So can it be made practicable? <laughs> I enjoyed this lecture from Roderick uh, Krenhagen yesterday um, because what he did is he took a 30,000 foot view and decided that what we should be focusing on is not so much how we manage disease but how we, how we look after health. It's health care rather than disease care and that makes sense to me. If we don't get sick, we're, we're not a chronic burden. And I rather like this and he introduced uh, what he, he has been developing with others in terms of a web-based system where as individuals can log in, can, can fill out a questionnaire, be given a profile of what their individual risks are, and then be given a program that they can follow if they wish. So it's self-driven, but it's based on, on their own demographics that would increase their risk. Now it is 30,000 feet because it's addressing the big issues, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, chronic lung disease and so on. So it's probably too high for us to apply to sarcoidosis, but I, I think this is, this, is, this is the future. And secondly, you know, there are other arenas in which we, we employ personalization that, that work really well. And here is just one example, uh, not totally remote from the thorax, obviously, but distinct from the lungs, where t two mutations or two genes, the mutations of which increase the risk 
of breast cancer by a staggering amount, 60 to 82 percent. And where you've got a risk based on a genetic mutation of that sort of magnitude, you can then personalize that to the individual. And, and clearly it needs to be put into the context of other factors, such as, is there a family history? How old is the patient? Uh, and then the individual can make decisions about management. How often should they have mammograms? And I know individuals who've actually elected, because they've had a sister die of this disease, to have prophylactic bilateral mastectomy. And it's only through having a risk of that sort of magnitude that, that you can personalize in, in a very practical fashion something which otherwise, of course, is lethal. I mean, there's nothing, there's nothing vague about this. This is binary. If it's a risk of breast cancer, there's only one thing that needs doing, it's getting rid of it. A and on the same lines, the, the pharma industry c can partner. And, I, and one of the themes I would like to develop during this talk is the way in which we can integrate clinical phenotype, genetic and other input, but with pharma. Uh, and here I'm showing you three examples of three drugs that have been developed, but also in association with a diagnostic kit that increases the likelihood that any individual will be suited by the nature of their pathology for a particular therapy, which is terrific in terms of balancing risk-benefit for any individual drug. So here's a practical example that transcends phenotype, genes, uh, gene expression at the protein level, uh, and an appropriate therapy. Just looking b briefly at sarcoidosis, I'm going to develop the sarcoid theme in, in much fuller later. But, but in terms of disease risk, are we anywhere close to personalizing that? Well, in terms of the 30,000 foot level, I, I mean, I don't think th there are any big factors that we can look at and say, wow, this increases the risk of sarcoidosis. And while looking at cause, and there were some lovely talks yesterday about, about uh, microbial uh, triggers, microbial triggers being facilitated by particulate triggers that raise the inflammatory environment, allowing those microbial triggers to manifest their granulomatous disease. Um, I, I don't think we've got quite enough information yet on cause, and particularly on the consequences of removing that cause and disease outcome, to, to form a particularly clear view as to how we can personalize it at this stage. I'm going to divert briefly uh, to a different disease again, uh, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. I showed this briefly yesterday, but with the intermune folks having access to over a thousand patients who took part in their two negative studies, we, we had this cohort and we were able to, to, to look at uh, two baseline, this is the trial, uh, we looked at two artificial baselines here with a, with a, a, a six month run in period from screening to 24 weeks. And then if the patient went through the study, there was a, a second 24-week period called run-in. And for those of you who couldn't see the pointer, I'm referring to the, the, the two uh, boxes that say run-in. So each of those represent 24-week periods where one could look at indices such as change in force vital capacity uh, and then look at what happened to the patient r in relation to those changes. And so what we were able to do, we took all of the indices that you might predictably think could have an impact on IPF, so age, smoking, severity of disease, and so on, and came up with four that were readily uh, accessible in the doctor's office. Age, have they been in hospital in the last six months? What is their force vital capacity, and what's happened to their force vital capacity in the last six months? And then breaking these down into, uh, into binary or tertiles, of a change, in fact the FEC predicted as a quartile, but looking at that, the, these were the strongest predictors. And from these one was able to derive a scoring system. So you'll see on the left side these four factors and each of the breakdown into different subsets of severity was assigned a score. And these scores could be added up and then related to uh, an individualization, customization if you, if you like. Uh, of the uh, one-year risk of death subsequently. So it's for the first time we got a chance of saying to an individual patient a more quantified version. And I draw your attention to the top line where it says example one, the demographics there. N note the 24-week change in forced vital capacity, and this example is minus 3%. 
here's an almost identical situation where everything is the same apart from the change in force vital capacity which is now 6.5 percent and this changes this individual's score and therefore his risk to now 30 to 40 percent now this needs validation it needs to be done with a different set but in theory this can help individualization of management when do you start treatment when do you refer for transplant when do you tell them to get their affairs in order uh, and speak to the family knowing they're going to die soon so this is this was the goal of this and it's early days yet but it, it's an example where we can use uh, personalization in, in a very practical sense taking into account you know the longitudinality of, of this patient's disease so what about soccer it's, jerry had some wonderful phrases didn't he and some of them were more polite than others but this one i like a lot uh, and, and, and he used it often in talks and he used it often in publications that all that glitters is not sarcoidosis and of course what he meant by this is if you see a granuloma be careful it may not be sarcoidosis and uh, lee newman referred to this yesterday and, uh, and in fact sarcoid probably doesn't exist it's probably a group of diseases eventually there'll be a cause for all of them but at the moment uh, th there is a, a a subset where we just don't know what is triggering it and so we operate like this, and I don't need to tell any of you, you're very familiar, we look at a patient who appears to have a granulomas dis disorder, do we find a cause with a detailed occupational, environmental, microbiological survey, uh, and then it's not sarcoid, and if we don't, it is sarcoid, and generally the, the definition demands that we see it in more than one organ, but of course... We're getting a little bit better at, at being precise with CT scans, for example, of, of, of being comfortable about diagnosing this disease, even if it is just in the lung. And I love these Frank Netter drawings. I just think this guy it was so creative. But, but what this slide shows us is, is not so much all that glitters is not sarcoidosis, but that sarcoidosis glitters in different ways. Uh, and the multiplicity of organs that can be involved in this disease and the multiplicity of combinations is actually an extraordinary challenge in our attempts to personalize our management of this disease. And so different phenotypes present themselves differently in different countries. We know this. There's no Lofgren's disease in Japan, for example. They get a lot of splenic disease, cardiac disease there. There are clearly different gene pools. There's a lot of overlap in Europe, but if you compare Europe with Japan or Europe with, uh, with other parts of Asia, there are different gene pools. Any genetic associations uh, are much more complicated to assign. As I've just shown you, the organ involvement I is very variable. Uh, and indeed, between and within individuals, there's a very variable rate of progression. So there are a lot of variables to put into the pot. Uh, but before we can get a comfort zone with uh, with um, with personalization, so where are we with regards to to having a single patient and 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 being able to get as much information to to personalize their health care? I want to talk a little bit about the concept of phenotypes, particularly how we might start to classify patterns of disease involving different organs, how we can take account of that especially with regard to what happens over time, so building in a, a complex mosaic, <coughs> but with a three-dimensionality. There's going to be some genetic data which I will show. Um, there will inevitably in the future be, be proteomic and, 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 and metabolomic data. I could not find anything that convinced me enough to spend too much time on that in this talk. It has to be the future, but we don't have strong enough sing singles yet in my view. Uh, and ultimately, there will be ph pharmacogenomic and other links with, with therapies that we use that might cause harm or therapies that may be indicated because the pharmacogenomics uh, are, are positive. And then, of course, these things will interlink with each other. And as I said earlier, I'm going to try and bring out uh, at least one of those links during this talk. We can all predict disease behavior from some phenotypes. If you've got disease in the brain, the heart, the eye, particular patterns of eye disease, we know these patients are going to have a tricky course. Uh, and, and the potential for harm from their disease is massive in these organs. So that's, that's an easy personalization of phenotype. But as I've just said, combinations of organ involvement are challenging. 
So what Bob Boffman led, and it seemed to have gone on for, for many years, Bob, but we, with lots of discussion, and it was a tricky thing to deal with, lots of discussion about how best to handle this, Bob led this WASOG task force, and tr just trying to assimilate these concepts of, of different organs and different people and change over time. And, we, uh, and what was, was come up with was, was three broad groupings of a patient observed for five years, and I'll return to that in a second. So patients seen, and this was a number of clinics around the world. It wasn't just one unit. It was uh, Asia, the Americas, Europe. So there's three groupings. The patient either gets better, has minimal disease, or persistent disease. So just looking at that left-hand block. Resolved disease can, for, uh, or minimal disease can be broken down into two subsets, those who never received treatment and therefore were really mild or resolved completely without a problem, or, or those who had minimal therapy. In the more persistent uh, disease categories, th there uh, is a subset with no current therapy, some of whom will have had treatment and some who did not. Uh, and then those who are on current therapy, and you can see for yourselves the way that was broken down, they were not getting worse in the last year, they were getting worse in the last year, those that got worse were symptomatic or those who were not. And these numbers don't refer to stages, we're not implying that patients move from one through nine, but just as a definition of different groupings. Now there are lots of critiques with this, you know, it, to personalize something but say I'm going to watch you for five years first, that's not going to be of great value, but the, the five years is an option, we use that because what happens over five years is usually it, but what happens over two years may change over the subsequent three years. But one could use this sort of classification over a shorter time frame as the basis for more prospective studies that will answer some of the personalization questions. So this is not the end, but, but it, it, may be, it may be the end of the beginning. The low. I love this picture of you. I don't know where I got this from, but I think it's just terrific. It's going on my bedroom wall. No, my wife won't let it go on my bedroom wall, but it's going to go somewhere really prominent. I'm going to fine tune on the lung for two reasons. One is, you know, I think most of us are pulmonologists, and this is, this is the area that taxes us most, particularly those people who get pulmonary fibrosis. Um, and, and secondly, just to try to reduce some of the variables to, to, to make some of the signals perhaps a little bit more cogent. Now, this is a a study that um, Nabil Hamza, uh, working with uh, Lisa Meyer and National Jewish, uh, has developed. And w when I was over there, we chatted a lot about this. And, and he came up with the observation that he said, well, look, the scanning stage is OK, but I see lots of patients with lots of nodules, really lots and lots of nodules, who are perfectly normal functionally with normal lung function tests. And I see the reverse. People haven't got much disease, but they've got bad lung function tests. So using x-ray stage alone to assess severity of sarcoidosis actually doesn't work very well. But using physiology alone may not necessarily work very well either. So he came up with the hypothesis. So let's try and combine the two, and then let's test it. So he grouped the, the radiographic, uh, the scatting radiographic scoring system stages and then he, he, he derived some moderately arbitrary but, 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 but clinically plausible tertiles of severity of disease. And he added airflow obstruction because that can be a, a kind of an individual taxing problem in sarcoidosis. And, and derived a scoring system. And you see from, from the top row um, which category of X-ray and lung function uh, deficit was awarded a particular score. And then Marjolaine went over to to Denver to do a mini sabbatical, and I guess th this was where the idea emerged from. But what Nabil and, and Marjolaine did was then took the scoring system, which was meant to be an index of severity, and see if it actually uh, w was matched by severity uh, of, of maximal exercise testing. And there were three very significant correlations that emerged from this, the VO2 max, PO2 at rest, and PO2 on maxil maximal exertion. So for me, that's moderately compelling that this scoring system is holding enough water in terms of its relationship with, with a quite different measure of severity that maybe this is worth testing. And again, this is, this is not the answer to the person sitting in front of you, but it certainly is the answer perhaps to scoring severity of disease and then doing some DNA or whatever 
and then seeing what happens in two years. So th th the seeds are being sown in terms of trying to get a better handle uh, on the phenotype issue. Looking at two of the forms of, of lung disease, one of which, Love grins, you might think, hey guys, no problem here, why is he talking about that? And then the type 4 lung disease where patients can have really awful attritional fibrosis. So let's look at Lofgren. And as you all know, this is a, a generally a, an acute disease characterized by bilateral hala, lymphadenopathy, fever, erythema nodosum, in Sweden particularly periarticular uh, disease of the ankle joints specifically. And this is a disease that generally gets better. You know, patients may need a bit of aspirin for this and that, but generally it gets better. Now, when Jan Hruters, who's here, w was working with us, having come over for a year from uh, Noah Hain in, in, in the Netherlands, working uh, also in the laboratory alongside Hiroi Sato, he found, uh, forget the nomenclature of the chromosomes, just think there's three major loci of the class 2 MHC system, DQ, DR, uh, and, and DP. And everything that follows beyond that is just a nomenclature to denote a different form thereof, a different allele. So DQ B10201 sounds a mouthful, but basically it's a specific allele of the DQ locus and DRB10301. So what Jan and Hiroi uh, identified is that there was a strong association with the DRB10301 allele, but also a really very striking association with that specific DQ allele. Uh, and these two were so tightly bound, as you all know, genes often track together. These were in such tight linkage to equilibrium, it was, it was really quite impossible to determine which was the dominant of these two. So just put them together. Uh, and, and as you've seen already, that there's a really very strong association between that particular haplotype, as this combination is called, with both erythema nodosum and Lofgren's syndrome. But what Jan then went on to, to develop in, as part of his thesis was that the DQ B10301, uh, sorry, DRB10301, DQ B10201 haplotype is also very strongly associated with, with a particular allele at a particular site in the tumor necrosis factor promoter. And this promoter is where nuclear transcription factors bind and turn genes on and off. So this all looked really very nice and also very tight. And look at those p-values. I mean, those are the things you love to get in your PhD thesis, right? Lots of lots of noughts. So that was very interesting. Now, Johan Grunwald uh, in, in Karolinska and Anders Eklund and others, and here Mary Berlin, had been looking at their population of Lofgrens. And as you all know, Lofgrens is, is particularly prevalent in Scandinavia. Lee Newman will tell me that's all of the pine pollen, but we'll possibly debate that later. And what he showed is that while in general people with Lofgrens syndrome, or indeed those with an acute onset of disease but didn't quite fulfill the Lofgrens syndrome criteria, if an individual had this DR3 gene, the same thing I've just shown you, they were much likely to have total remission over a two-year period than the individuals who had DR3 negativity. So I'm addressing the yellow boxes here. If you look at the yellow boxes, there are less people who are restored to normality two years later. And then Johan Anandas Eklund looked at this in a much bigger population, published a couple of years ago in the Blue Journal, and came up with an identical conclusion. So in other words, if they had a Lofgren's patient, and this is 10% of their patient population, who comes to clinic and has a DR3 negative, that denotes that they are likely to have a much more prolonged course, which clearly has implications on when you might start steroids, for example. And they now use this. So the answer to the question, Molly, is yes, we're ready for it, because they use it in clinical practice in this scenario. So that's kind of neat, and as we know, as I showed you, this particular haplotype is associated with the presence of uh, an A base at the minus 308 position in the tumor necrosis factor promoter. And Myelane's team have looked at this not just in Lofgren's, but in a bro broad range of patients, uh, and found that those individuals who carry just one of the A alleles that needn't be homozygote, they have a better outcome. So if you've got Lofgren's syndrome, you've got a better outcome. Uh, and if you've got more general sarcoidosis, you have a better outcome. 
This is a study uh, of the relationship between carrying an A allele and the amount of tumor necrosis factor in the serum. And what you see here is if you carry the A allele, you've got more TNF in the serum. I must add that, that there is some controversy. Not all papers show this, but there are enough that do to make us think that it may be, it may be sound. I'm going to di di diverge any slightly, and I hope you'll see the reason for diverging in a minute. When the infliximab study of, of sarcoidosis was published, there were a number of questions that were asked, and the most important, obviously, was which patients might respond better to this drug, because clearly it's an expensive drug. You can't give everybody. So can you tailor it? Personalization. And, and what the team showed was that those who had a lower... FVC that had a dyspnea of a particular grade, longer disease duration, certain skin or CNS manifestations or C-reactive protein, they were more likely to respond to this drug. But also, interestingly, don't be confused by this LDD thing, which confused me enormously, but think of that as being the median. So anybody who had a TNF-alpha serum level above the median had a lower FVC at presentation, the left-hand graph, compared to those whose uh, TNF factor uh, levels were less than the median. But more strikingly and interestingly to my eye, if you look at the right-hand graph, what you're seeing is the breakdown of placebo effect and infliximab effect, again broken down by whether an individual had below or above the median levels in their serum. And those individuals with high TNF levels were more likely to have a response to infliximab. I suppose kind of logically, you've got a lot there, you can block it more, you block the effects more. But I, I thought that was very interesting. And those individuals had a much better change in their force vital capacity in, in response to therapy. Now, I'm hearing the cynics in the audience saying, hang on a minute, I've seen the infliximab study. There's a really very small change. Look at that. The combined groups, the three milligram per kilogram, the five milligram per kilogram, a mean improvement of 2.5% in the force vital capacity at week 24. Not much difference between the high and lower dose groups compared to placebo. I said this yesterday, and for those who weren't here, the, the, the problem, and it's a prevalent problem, and, and I've had this talking to people who are really extraordinarily smart who don't get the problem. And the problem is that what they do, or what some folks do, is they say a 2.5% difference in mean change and then they translate that to, is that significant for my single patient in my office? Well, of course it's not. It may not be. might be. But, but, but it's the process of translating a difference between group data to an individual patient. That is the flaw. You shouldn't do it. What that is telling us is if you are in Fliximab, your disease behaved differently from if you weren't. Period. So then you drill down and try and figure out what it is. And what it is here is that when you look at those individuals who changed by more than 10% over time, there were a much greater percentage, almost a three-fold greater percentage of those individuals in the infliximab group. So in other words, this study has been decried for being negative. I've looked at it forever, and it's a beautifully conducted and quite complex study. I think this is a positive study. And I'm really pleased that there are now phase two of another bunch of imabs whose names I can't pronounce uh, in sarcoidosis. And, and, and hopefully there'll be a phase three study or two to follow. But in that context, is it possible to predict now going back to genotype, which individuals are more likely to respond to infliximab? We've seen here in sarcoid, the higher the levels you do well, theoretically because of what I've shown you, these people should all carry the allele. And these are two studies from the rheumatological literature. This is rheumatoid arthritis. And what you're seeing here is the reverse of that. So in, in this, it was a series with some meta-analysis. Individuals who carried an A were more likely to be a non-responder. So that's counterintuitive to what I just said. Published six months later, it's another meta-analysis that, that reverses that. It suggests that there, there is not sound enough evidence yet to, to link a, a particular tumor necrosis factor promoter polymorphism um, with, uh, with efficacy in, in rheumatoid arthritis. But I think what we can do is to conclude in TNF-alpha, again, linked to that particular uh, MHC class II haplotype, that, that if you have an A allele, you've got a better outcome in Lefgren syndrome. 
You've got a better outcome from myelin's work in all other forms of lung sarcoidosis, particularly. That if you carry, uh, particularly the homozygous variant, you have more TNF. And you might argue the more TNF, the better chance the drug has of working. Uh, but as yet, there are, there are no correlations, certainly in sarcoidosis, between the efficacy of infliximab uh, and uh, pr 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 uh, promoter polymorphisms at either the, the minus 308 or the 857, a, a, a different allele that can be associated with different forms of sarcoidosis. So there's work to be done, but it's sort of intriguing, I thought. And just to round off, this is the lung disease that we really need to try and get a handle on. I don't know about you guys, patients often used to come with this. You didn't watch them go through to fibrosis, did we? we they often presented like this, and you think, gosh, if only we got them earlier. And in fact, getting them earlier really does demand our getting some handle uh, on prediction. Um, and, and there are some data that may suggest, you know, we could construct some hypotheses that could be tested globally. So here from the Karolinska and the Brompton and Maastricht, if you carry a particular DRB, the 1401 or the 1501 uh, or the DQB10602 variant, and these are again in tight linkage equilibriums, if you've got one, if you've got the, the R allele, you're likely to have the Q allele. This is associated with more persistent or more severe lung disease. At Brompton, Hiraisato has shown that a, a nod gene, a, a car gene, um, which has been found to be significant and worse Crohn's disease, interesting, you know, the granulomatous disease, uh, is associated with more persistent lung disease measured on both lung function and uh, chest radiographic uh, indices. We've heard a bit about the BNTL2 uh, gene. Myelin again showed this is related to a more persistent process, but, but suggested that this might be really tightly linked to, to BRB15. Uh, and, th and that was our study at the Brompton. The, the, these are in tight li linkage uh, disequilibrium, so determining if the BNT L2 gene has an independent effect is still an open question in my view. And then Jan Krutas more recently <laughs> has looked at a bone morphogenic protein family haplotype and again found that this is associated with a more increased likelihood of having fibrotic disease two years out. So here are studies that have taken in the context of, um, uh, of lo longitude. Uh, and as you look down that, there is a sort of a common theme. What I like about the, the DR1415-0602 is that it's across different populations. I think the ACCESS study came up with it, 14 or 15, I can't remember which of those it is. But So there's a, there's a, there's a transnationality to this. And once you've got that, you can really start to personalize in a way that is meaningful ac across the globe, not necessarily in the country in which you've done your study. So there are considerable problems to, to personalization at, at the moment, and I've tried to, to characterize what some of those are. Um, but, but my conclusion to the question that was posed to me, is sarcoid ready for... Per Darn sure it is, and we need it. Because we can't treat everybody the same because of the complexities of their disease, but we don't yet have all the tools. And we need, first of all, to be able to classify them in a way that we'll apply internationally, be it the WASOG version, be it the Muller-Quernheim version that we heard yesterday, or, or the, uh, or the um, Nabil version that we, for the lungs specifically, that I, that I showed you. But we, we need to be able to have a basket of oranges, not a basket of all fruits, to test. And then we can start to see if anything we collect at time point zero relates to that progression. Now we have prediction and prediction of risk of worseness. And that, for me, is, is, a, is a really crucial goal at the moment. Ultimately, we want the risk of getting the disease. That's a bit ivory tower. That's 10 years. But, but getting a prediction you're going to be worse, that, for me, is critical. And I think the way in which we can do it, I've tried to give a hint that that genetics may be there. I mean, I, you, could, you could mount an argument for doing the TNF minus 308 allele. It's simple enough to do in certain contexts. As I said to you, the Swedes are already doing this. Um, I think the question about whether there's a practical role for other genotyping will need further study, but there are hints that there may be. Protein and metabolites have to come, but I, I think they're much further down the pipeline to, to, to my eye. Uh, and at the moment, but we will, they'll come. There are no consistent pharmacogenomic signals. So the problems clearly 
are the, the ethnicity. We've got to make sure that w what we do in one country or two countries together is, is, uh, is, is reproducible elsewhere and is valid elsewhere. And in that context, using genes, as I said earlier, can be tricky because there are different gene pools. So people have different predispositions by that fact. But, but, but I do think they're superable. And, and you know, we all, we all trot, trot, trot this out as a mantra sometimes. We've got to get together, guys. We get, but we really do. We have to be consistent. And that's what WASOG is all about. Jerry would have been up here saying, WASOG has to solve this. So I'm going to finish where I started. This is, uh, this is Jerry. For those who don't know him, this is Dame Sheila Sherlock next to him. And if anybody could be more famous than Jerry James, it actually is Sheila. She is an absolutely eminent hepatologist who, who passed away a year or, or two before Jerry. They, they were great partners. And I think if Jerry had been at this meeting, he'd have thought, wow, you know, we've moved on. We have moved on. And he'd say that to us with a smile, and then he'd grab us and say, but we haven't moved on far enough. So I'd like to stop by urging you all, as Jerry would have done at this point, to say, look, it's great to be here. It's great to see the younger generation but find the cause of sarcoidosis. Thank you very much. Do you think that you're done now? It's a great, a great pleasure, and uh, dear Ron, it's a great pleasure and honor that you accepted the invitation to uh, help this uh, challenging uh, uh, presentation, and I think you uh, did it wonderful. I enjoyed your talk, but especially I enjoy your friendship. And uh, just to uh, offer you something from the organization, from the foundation, but also especially from the organization of this 10th WASOC uh, BEL meeting, and it's uh, sort of uh, the theme of this conference is uh, cooperation and let this be a bridge between us. I've been instructed to open it and I do everything this woman says. <laughs> Oh, wow. Thank you. I'm going to tre treasure this enormously. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>